Welcome to the Dream Boat Podcast, a place where we talk about everything dreamy. All you wanted to know about dreams and where you might find some answers. My name is Dave Billington, and I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm also director of the Dream Research Institute. And I'm joined by fellow psychotherapist, Laura Payne. Hello, I'm Laura Payne, and I'm also part of the Dream Research Institute. And we're called the Dream Boat because we are actually recording our podcast on a beautiful canal barge here at Little Venice in London called the Boat Pod. We'll be looking at dreams, talking to guest experts, and answering your questions. Now, let's get on with the episode. While we ponder on the nature of dreams and why we dream, and many of the modern interpretations of our dreams as our unconscious yearnings, we can't ignore the whole concept of dreams as inspiration, where the dreamer has dreamt that eureka moment. Yes, historical dreamers and famous dreamers today acknowledge that their discoveries, their artwork, their literature, or even movies came about during a dream. So for this episode, we thought it would be fun to look at some of the world's famous dreams that have not only been inspiring, but in many cases have gone on to change our knowledge of the world or even given us an exciting new discovery. So, Dave, what's been the famous dream that you've found? For me, the number one is that Einstein actually dreamt his groundbreaking theory of relativity. Hmm. So uh, Einstein's theory of relativity came to him in a dream about cows. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> so he dreamed he was walking through a farm when he came upon some cows by an electric fence. And then he saw the cows jump at the same time as the fence gave them an electric shock. But a, a farmer who had been standing at the other end of the field saw them jump one by one like a Mexican wave. And Einstein realized in the dream that their views of the same event had been different. And, and this led to the theory of relativity. So it's the, that the idea that events look different depending on where you're standing because of the time it takes for the light to reach your eyes. Well, thank goodness for Swiss cows is all I can say. <laughs> yes. What I like about this story is that Einstein writes as part of this that the intuitive mind, and this is Einstein, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honours the servant and has forgotten the gift, which I think for a lot of scientists that would become as a surprise that the intuitive aspect of the self is uh, seen as important as the rational mind. And I think actually for uh, a lot of scientists that wouldn't be surprising as well because there are those that, that are trying to think creatively about uh, problems that are uh, mathematical or physical and actually become aware that it's the intuition that gives you the hypothesis that then you can test in that you know, strict scientific method in, in an irrational way. Yeah, I was reading uh, one neuroscientist who said the truth is that the mind requires sleep, intuition and unconscious modes of cognitive processing for problem solving and the generation of innovative ideas. So there is something about the freedom that the rational mind has when it's asleep that can provide a sort of fertile, fertile turf for looking at things in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also, I found this also quite interesting that uh, scientists are often grouped apparently into two brackets uh, according on their working habits. They're either accumulators and guessers. The accumulators gradually gather and accumulate data, building upon and modifying existing knowledge. And the, ge the guessers have flashes of insight, leaps, hunches, intuitions and dreams, which can then be tested obviously using the more of a rational approach to see if the ideas are sound. Ideas and hunches often come to the mind when it's relaxed and not deliberately concentrating on technical problems. And I think Einstein would definitely have uh, signed up for that in, in, in some way. 
I think that is uh, uh, an approach or an idea that a lot of artists would be familiar with. And we often think about artists and scientists as working in completely different realms in completely different ways. But uh, for the, the practice of creativity, people talk about this need to have the, the space and the freedom to just make some connections and allow uh, different ideas to come together. And that actually that is a big part of what creativity is, not inventing something new, but seeing a connection between two existing things or more that you're familiar with. You're even seeing it in a fundamentally different way. As Einstein, the story of Einstein, he actually realised that there were two different modes of seeing the same thing, which led him to obviously the fundamental theory of uh, relativity. Uh, we're going to go on, obviously, and have a look at um, some art and literature that's come out from dreams, but just staying with science for now. Mm -hmm. For chemistry geeks, we have uh, the structure of benzene, which was discovered by August Kerkule in the late 18th century after a dream about snakes. Now, I know a lot of people probably find that quite horrific. Freud but, would have uh, had something to say about that <laughs> and probably nothing to do with benzene. Yeah, exactly. So uh, benzene is uh, part of the sort of petrochemical industry. It's got to, it's often, it's the benzene part that gives the sweet smell to uh, petrol. And it is for the those who want the technical part, it's six carbon atoms in a ring. And that's the particular part of it with one hydrogen atom attached to each carbon. And so it looks like a flower. It's a, it, it, it has a sort of a, a very flat circular uh, look to it. And uh, Kirkley realised that the snakes in his dream were a representation of benzene and its structure. And, uh, and that, at that point, it was unlike anything else in chemistry, apparently. Oh, that's really fascinating. And another one I like on the science side is uh, the dreaded periodic table. Those of you who have studied chemistry will know that uh, it's uh, something that you have to memorise and probably curse whoever invented it. Well, take a bow, Dmitry Mendeleev the late 19th century Russian chemist who was exhausted from three days, apparently, of trying to classify the 56 elements. So he quite rightly decided he was going to sleep on it. And he writes, I saw in a dream a table where all the elements fell into place as required. Awakening, I immediately wrote it down on a piece of paper. And apparently only in one place did a correction seem later necessary. Wow. I really like that. And it is quite visual, I suppose, when you see it. But again, the the ability for the mind to organise thoughts and facts and data, but structure it, as you say, from an imaginative point of view into something that's very visual. Well, And it really puts a contrast to an idea that a lot of people seem to have about uh dreams and, and the sleep state that it's kind of there's this randomness to it and that what's going on you know people have this attitude that's like oh you know that's just kind of you know brain junk from from you know uh, the, the cleaning service that's in the brain at night kind of thing and really what we see is that there is this organizational side to it there is uh a, as we've said in other episodes, a sense of there actually being a kind of deeper wisdom going on in the unconscious parts of our brain and that they are able to know things that the conscious mind doesn't necessarily know and to solve the problems that the conscious mind hasn't quite been able to get on top of during the day. Now, the ancients, of course, would say that these were distinct messages from the gods sending you these images to solve these problems. But whether that's the case or not, the history has a long history of dreams that have been utterly inspired with the eureka moment being sort of sought on and found in some way. Mm hmm. So uh, another one, another scientific eureka moment uh, was around the structure of the atom, which uh, in 1922 was the Danish physicist Niels Bohr. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize in physics for conceiving the model of the atom. And uh, he was uh, asleep when he had a vision of the planets attached to pieces of string circling the sun. 
And he woke up from this dream and he could suddenly envision the way that uh, electrons moved uh, mm. around the nucleus of the atom. Amazing, amazing. I think DNA is the same as well, isn't it? Yeah, uh, one of the uh, greatest scientific discoveries of all time was the discovery of DNA's structure. Uh, and this was a Dr. James Watson. So again, with the snakes, he had a dream that involved two snakes intertwined with heads at opposite ends, leading to his consideration of, of the double helix that we now know. Yes, I think there's another version of that as well. Apparently his alma mater, which was the Indiana University in the States, uh, he they say that in the dream he stumbled upon the double helix image for DNA through a dream of a spiral staircase. So I'm not sure which version is correct, but mm -hmm. uh, I think the point here is that uh, the solution and the image was actually found in the dream state. Yeah, and uh, does the image of... Uh, Two snakes twined around each other remind you of anything? Well, yes, thank you for that cue. <laughs> <laughs> Back to my dear friend Asclepius, the god, yes. Uh, mm. So the the staff of healing is the two snakes, obviously, around the staff that uh, Asclepius had. In fact, Asclepius had uh, one snake around the staff and it then went on to have the two snakes. And I was fascinated uh, when reading this that Again, how there are these universal images, the mm -hmm. notion of, as Jung would say, of the universal consciousness that somehow that we're tapping into these repetitive images over the millennia, it sometimes feels, mm -hmm. that still have answers for us in some way and that how they, these, the, these images are repeated and, and are just as powerful for different reasons. And yeah. to have the ancient image for medicine as being the two snakes, which on, as part of the Hippocratic Oath is part of four doctors, is on that, is on that, is on that image, is in that image. Yeah, the, the symbol that you see sometimes still outside the, the chemist or, or pharmacies and is on the, the logos of many medical associations and hospitals. Yep, there it is. And is also related to DNA. I find that quite incredible, actually, as a yeah. repeat. Yeah, I, I love those sort of harmonies that, uh, that come out. Nice word, yeah, harmony, I like it like that. I think that one of the other science ones that uh, I uh, was very interested in was uh, the invention of the sewing machine. Everyone thinks that's to do with Singer. Well, it then transpires that Singer was actually taken to court by the original inventor, which was uh, a 19th century American called Elias Howe, who was apparently exhausted from attempts to develop a machine that could stitch fabric together in a lock lock stitch fashion so he um had a dream whereby um cannibals were preparing to cook him as they danced about <laughs> waving spears and that the spears had a hole at the sharp tip and yay eureka that's how how got the idea to pass the thread through the point of the needle instead of at the end which is how people had been attempting before and of course has changed the way that clothing has been manufactured ever since um there's a a, a great piece of sort of family record that t talks about the dream and uh, uh the warriors carrying uh spears but uh Anyway, it, the, he developed the sewing machine on the back of that and <laughs> ended up having to def defend his patent in a court case that lasted for about six years because he found that, uh, that Isaac Sing Singer had uh, perfected a, a copy of his machine and was selling it with the same locks this lock stitch method that Howard had dreamt about and patented. Anyway, uh, uh, how one... But Singer from then on has obviously got uh, the name on every, well, all the key sewing machines. I think every home has probably got a Singer sewing machine in it somewhere. somewhere. So, yeah, certainly that was my, my mother had a Singer sewing machine when I was growing yeah, up. Mine did as well. But mm. uh, it was Elias, Elias Howe who worked out the problem in a dream. Oh, that's fascinating. So, different kind of uh, technical uh, dream and dream inspiration. 
um, was around the beginning of Google yeah, as well. Yeah, nice modern one, this one. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so if, in this one, it was uh, Larry Page, who as a student, he had an irrational fear that he'd been accepted into Stanford University by by mistake. Uh, it sounds like a, a little bit of the, the classic imposter syndrome <laughs> going on for, uh, for Mr. Page. Um, so that triggered an anxiety dream for him. And, and he imagined that he could download the entire web onto some old computers that he had lying around. And he got up in the middle of the night to uh, do some, some mathematics. As you do. As you do, yeah. <laughs> and, and he realized that it was actually plausible. And so he took two years out of studying to create what became Google. And, you know, it's something that is so completely, uh, I can, you know, fundamental, so necessary to our daily life and, and the modern world. And uh, we wouldn't have had that if he hadn't had that, uh, that anxiety dream. Yeah, exactly. So we'll bring on the anxiety dreams. <laughs> can, I, can I just tell you a little story that's related to the, the, kind of the beginning of the, the World Wide Web, uh, which was uh, when my nephew was, mm, what would he have been? Very young, five or six, something like that. And my brother was explaining to him, you know, when I was a kid, you know, we didn't have computers, you know, and it wasn't a computer in every house. And, um, you know, there was there was one that was in a school in the, in the town, you know, but nobody really had access to computers. And my nephew said, uh, yeah, but how did everyone connect to the Internet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, if you think about it, you know, to Google is a verb. Yeah. You know, it's that ubiquitous now. You saying that reminded me of a of uh, my nephew. I was looking for something and uh, he, I was... I think it was helping him with his homework. So I said, oh, well, should we have a, have a little look? So he turned, he was only young, and he said, yes, auntie. He said, Google knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a few of us might feel a bit sort of different about that now, but, uh, yeah, from the, out of the mouth of babes, one way or another. Yes, indeed. Uh, so obviously science and uh, the imagination and dreaming has dreaming has obviously had a big impact on um, some fundamental changes of things that have been brought into our lives through inventions and discoveries. But uh, let's have a look at the arts, shall we? Sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the ones that that comes up first in looking at the arts is about Beethoven. And uh, apparently he was a, a prolific dreamer and he heard many of his piano sonatas in his dreams and then wrote them down afterwards. And some historians even say that his dreams featured instruments that uh, were not yet invented. So uh, we'll have to wait to hear another symphony uh, on one of those instruments oh, yeah, when they're invented. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, we've then obviously got... Uh, uh, Paul McCartney during the Beatles era wrote yesterday while dreaming and uh, he woke up apparently with the music in his head and I can understand that actually I often wake up thinking and hearing music mm -hmm. but not something that I would be able to write down as I'm not a musician and he wrote it out apparently on the piano next to him and uh, it you know I think a lot of Beatles songs probably have a dream like quality but apparently uh, he didn't have any idea for lyrics, so he put down some lines when he was writing the music out about scrambled eggs <laughs> as the initial lyrics. Uh, I think that's quite funny. <laughs> yeah, it would have been a very different song. Uh, yes, somewhat. Maybe still would have fitted in with the Beatles canon somehow. And then we also have uh, Keith Richards, uh, apparently uh, is, uh, was very talented while he was uh, while asleep and... Uh, the 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 famous one I can't get no satisfaction was created while he was asleep. Apparently, he would go to bed with his guitar and wake up the next morning, and um, had been basically had left a tape recording machine running all night. And he realised that when he woke up, that the tape machine had run to the very end, and um, he 
wondered whether he'd actually played anything or whatever during the night. And so he hit the button apparently while he was asleep. And so when he played it back, there is this apparent ghostly version of the opening verse to I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And uh, apparently after the opening verse, there are 40 minutes of him snoring. Given some of Keith Richards' habits, it's amazing that he knew when he was awake and when he was asleep back in the <laughs> 70s. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's on the music front. Yeah, so maybe we can turn to literature. And uh, if you're interested, a friend of the show, Alice Vernon, has written in her book Night Terrors about the origins uh, of some of the the famous works of literature that were inspired by, by dreams. Uh, but one of the famous works of literature that were ins- is inspired by a dream was uh, Mary Shelley and uh, Frankenstein. And uh, there's this quote from uh, Mary Shelley talking about the, the genesis of that book and of that story. She says, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with an uneasy half vital motion. And uh, she talks about the, uh, the, the impact that this had on her. But this was at a time when uh, her and uh, some other writers in, in the, the writing group that her and, and uh, yes, Percy Shelley, Shelley had. Yes, she- yeah. Shelley and Byron. That's yeah. right, yeah. It was a competition apparently that night. That's right. To, and it was to come up with a spooky story specifically, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they went to sleep. I think they were in some castle in Switzerland and... Uh, they all agreed that hers was the best and uh, was probably the first sci-fi novel people often put down, the Frankenstein novel. It certainly uh, stands the test of time. Well, it's very gothic, I know that much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and look at the number of people that have then, you know, worked with it from a film point of view and, and, and reference it as an image in many ways. Yeah, and uh, I guess after that, then Frankenstein's Frankenstein's monster probably entered into the nightmares of children for generations <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it makes me wonder whether it might have then gone on to have inspired Monsters Inc. The film, which yeah. is about you know obviously children and uh, and monsters, but uh, for the romantics, the dream state is an important part of inspiration, and a lot of the work it reflects notions of the dream state. That another one that's again, I suppose, in the sci-fi mode is Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, and uh, apparently uh, Robert Louis Stevenson was rather partial to a few drugs like laudanum, which a lot in the sort of nineteenth century were taking, which is a heroin derivative, which was fully accepted by society. But mm. he was also apparently quite partial to opium in its pure state and cocaine and uh, he had a night of slumber apparently but came to him during a very drug-induced nightmare and uh, he started screaming out loud which disturbed his wife Fanny who angrily woke him up and startled (laughs) he turned around and said why did you wake me I was dreaming a fine bogey tale which is how he (laughs) described his night and uh, anyway, the very first draft of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, he wrote it when he was in a fever and uh, the, first, uh, the first draft was actually burned by his wife and uh, so he had to then rewrite the 30,000-word book over a three-day period and uh, it was an important piece for them because they were seriously in debt as a couple so the sales from this made a big difference to their lives. It should probably be said that uh, using cocaine and writing a 30,000-word story in one draft is not a guaranteed formula for success. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) However, you know, the uh, exploration and the research into psychedelics and dreaming Mm -hmm. is quite a big area of research currently. It is, yeah. And uh, something that we'll obviously talk about in in another episode, but... uh, Uh, again, dream states and the different levels of consciousness that dreaming can take place on as a different plane. Obviously, drug-induced planes of consciousness will 
encourage, I suppose, different types of dreams. I think it's. I think this one's quite interesting. I don't. In that uh, it was drug induced, and we've got. Um, I was thinking of another one where you got Samuel Taylor Cooleridge, who with the Kubla Khan, that also came up apparently after taking laudanum. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. I used to have the entire thing memorized when <laughs> oh. I was a kid. I loved it. Oh, I'm impressed. That's very good. <laughs> yeah. And also, isn't it beautifully visual? It's got yeah. such a dreamlike quality about it. Yeah. Movie like. Good cue there, Dave. What should we talk about movies? Yes. Uh, well, actually, just one more thing about Coleridge, because what I remember about that as well is that uh, he was having his little uh, laudanum helps uh, nap uh, outside somewhere, and he was having this wonderful dream that he then woke up from and was writing it down. And then somebody came by and interrupted him, and he couldn't remember the rest of it, which is why it's uh, a relatively short poem and uh, comes to a somewhat abrupt end. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, isn't that just typical when you're in the midst of a really good dream and then you you, you just cannot remember it? It's so annoying. Yeah. Oh, dear. Hence dream journals, everybody. Yes. <laughs> but yes, you wanted to talk about uh, movies. Movies, yeah. So, um, I mean, I... I it's interesting because in the early days of uh, movies, they were the Hollywood was known as the Dream Factory, mm -hmm. and uh, or even uh, Dream. I think cinemas were even called Dream Theatres. That's great. I wish they were still called that now. I, I love going to the cinema, but I think I'd go more often if they were called Dream Theatres. Hmm. So, you know, uh, I think we've got uh, one of our famous uh, movie directors, and probably a lot of people know this, is, of course, James Cameron. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can invite him on the podcast sometime in the future. But, uh, yeah, apparently some of his most famous films were inspired by dreams as well. He has this quote, uh, my own private streaming service runs every night for free. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so we've got... Uh, I think one of the uh, dreams that he had, which was inspired, again, uh, from a fever, a bit like Robert Louis Stevenson, he imagined an explosion and coming out of it was a robot cut in half, clutching kitchen knives and crawling towards him. And that was the start of he sketched the Terminator down when he woke up. And obviously uh, the actor Arnold Schwarzenegger made the character his own. Yeah. And so then we uh, we go on, obviously, to the the, the Avatar franchise, which came to I, I didn't realise this came to him as a teenage dream. Oh. So um, now uh, sixty eight, he first had the idea um, when he was a nineteen year old college student, and uh, again uh, the idea came when he was fast asleep. And he had a dream and he decided to do some drawings that uh, really were the early concepts of the Avatar franchise. Oh. And he said that uh, he had uh, woken up after dreaming of a bioluminescent forest with trees that looked like fibre optic lamps and that the river was glowing bioluminescent particles. And there was a kind of purple moss on the ground that lit up when you walked on it. And then there were these kind of lizards, he said, that didn't look like much until they took off. And they turned into rotating fans like a living frisbee. And they would come down and land on something. And it was all in the dream and he said that he woke up super excited and actually drew it all down and he actually has the drawings and so that uh, he says now that it saved them from several lawsuits because he could show them the drawings and uh, you know and and point out that he did them when he was 19 and going to junior college and uh, he could show people the glowing trees and the purple moss and the flying lizards it's amazing um, and it is it's all in those films isn't it i can i can picture it now as as you're describing it yeah it's uh, so um interesting again i think in many ways, movies lend themselves or dreams lend themselves to movies. I was thinking Salvador Dali in particular uh, did a series of films about based on dreams, which obviously you know brings us on to uh, dreams and art. 
Uh, the art uh, you know, dreams have been in, an inspiration for so much art uh, that uh, you know I was sort of spoilt for choice. Really, I was looking at a lot of the William Blake illustrations and yeah. drawings, which are uh, again come come out of him his his dream state. Obviously, for the surrealists, you know, dream and reality existed on the same plane, and for a lot of them, their dreams were. The, their art were their dreams just recreated in some way. Yeah, and they were often really inspired by the ideas coming out of psychoanalysis and the idea of you know, this kind of the, the forbidden and the repressed that's hidden in the unconscious and kind of actively pursued those dreams. And you look at Dali's paintings, which are you know, full of images of, of uh, sex and sexuality, as well as, you know, just peculiarity and, you know, time being bent and, and space uh, being flexible and malleable. Uh, you can really see that, that they do come directly out of the dream world. Yeah, apparently Dali met Freud and Freud was really confused by Dali <laughs> and uh, uh, he couldn't understand uh, how uh, Dali got to where he got to in some of the dreams and, and didn't really fully accept some of Freud's uh, uh, propositions around the dream state. Anyway, he uh, Dali obviously, had, and you know, look, go and have a look at the metamorphosis of narcissists. I think that's a really interesting dream to have a look at. Uh, but... Either way, there is a wonderful uh, portrait of Freud that was done by Dali after their meeting, and uh, so something came out of the, the them getting together. Uh, there's also uh, other artists. There's uh, Leonora Carrington. There's a, a, a wonderful portrait that she did, which is in the National Portrait Gallery in London. Uh, Max Ernst and uh, René Magritte, who... Uh, was a real inspiration for me when I was uh, like probably a teenager and I was interested in art and I was interested in dreams and, and it was kind of, uh, he was my introduction into surrealism with his uh, wonderful, odd, really uh, dreamlike uh, images that he created. Mm. So what do you think is going on here? Because obviously, you know, we, we've talked about the image and the dream state I, I'm always curious about that moment just before you wake or as you are waking. Mm -hmm. uh, if any of you've got a Fitbit or a smartwatch of some kind, you'll you'll know when you then go back if you've got the ability to look at the sleep app part of that, that just before you wake very often is when you have your REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep, which is when we know that we are we are in our dream state. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I, I, I'm curious about that, what I call that fertile zone between sleep and wake that is full of imagery, but you're, you've, it's tangible. You, you can play with it in some way. I know a lot of people, a lot of business people will say that if they've got problems, uh, the solution comes in that early morning slumber as you're just waking up. Yeah. Well, you can you it's it's tangible in some way. Yeah, the the way that I would would look at that is that is this time when the barrier, which is often quite firm, uh, between the conscious aspect of ourselves and the unconscious part of ourselves, is thin. You know, and for some people, that barrier is so firm that they don't remember their dreams at all, uh, maybe for periods of time or, or, you know, maybe just habitually they don't remember their dreams. But for other people, it's actually a window that you can look through. And what it brings up for me is, is this idea that comes from, from Jung, that when the, the conscious and the unconscious can meet, it's like there's this release of energy within the psyche and, and within the, the consciousness. When they're separated, then that it's like the, the two poles of the battery can't quite meet. And so I feel like that's such an exciting time for that kind of generative power of the conscious and the unconscious meeting. I think that's really lovely. It's what what the ancients would have called the lifting of the veil. Yeah. It has that same sort of feel. Okay, it's time for Dream of the Week. 
And for the dream of the week this time, we're doing the second part of uh, a two-part dream. We talked about the first part in uh, an earlier episode. And if you remember, it was the dream that started with uh, going out with some companions. And then the dreamer ends up down on a, a, a muddy, dried up riverbed. And she gets caught up in a landslide. She gets the message, you can't go back, you have to go through this. And then she gets washed away into this room where there are warm showers. And she's with a young man and they're all being cleansed in this uh, kind of spa-like place. And she realizes that they need to get out of the doors or they're gonna just keep going round and round. So that was the first part of the dream. In the second part of the dream, it starts like this. I remember there is a secret passage and I realize we are all illegal immigrants and this is our route to the promised land. It's fraught with dangers and this is just the start of it. I'm with other people and I'm looking for a door, which I realize is in a plunge pool. And the two men are cautious. I go down and I find a tube-like corridor under the water. And I take a breath to go through it, to go under the water, but then I pull out saying, I'm not ready to go through, but this is the way. And the young man goes through. I sit in the water near a young mother and a teenage daughter saying, I'm not ready. The mother goes somewhere and I start sobbing saying, I don't wanna die in that corridor all alone. I don't want to scare the daughter, but I can't stop myself. And then the mother comes back and says, you won't remain there. I would pull you out on the other side. And the implication is that if I die, she won't just leave me there, but I know she will. She has two children to take care of. She's been through this before as well, and I am in awe at her courage to do it again and with two children. And that's the end of the dream. And just, just to remind you, uh, Laura, again, of, of yeah. what was uh, in the background, what was the context of the dream. The dreamer said that uh, she's just started on a psychotherapy course and uh, is, is kind of uh, fighting against this idea or working with this idea as well, that, that the process uh, has to be under my ego's control, or maybe it doesn't work that way. And uh, she's been processing the fear of things that are not under her conscious control. And also, she said the day before the dream, she behaved in a way that made her feel guilty and recognized that there is more work to be done. Yeah, it's a really interesting dream, isn't it? I, I'm always fascinated by passageways in dreams. Yeah. Obviously, they can represent so many things, particularly if they're secret. Is that part of ourselves? Is it part of an area of ourselves that we have shut away and we don't want to go into? Mm -hmm. Also, there, there was a great sensation of this what, of being what I would call a birthing dream. Yes, that's exactly where my mind yeah, went to. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's... Obviously, with the going through the passageway and then there's this sort of tube-like corridor and water, it feels very much like a birthing dream. And I was thinking the start of a new course, the start of a new development as, as a person. Very often when you're doing a psychotherapy course, having done one, mm -hmm. I remember back thinking you're in therapy and it's almost like some new part of you is looking to be born. Yeah, yeah. It also reminds me then of of you know the dreamers struggling with this idea of maintaining control or letting go of control, and there's something that really seems to harmonize with that idea of birth. It's like this initial moment of there's a process happening, and you're not in charge of it. In fact, it's in charge of you, and really the only thing to do ultimately is to go along with it yeah, go in the flow <laughs> go with the flow and here she is she's she's in the water which i think we talked about last time that that you know water is often the metaphor for our feeling function and also the unconscious as in the dream state as well That's you often right. get water in dreams that represent that type of stepping in the flow for want of a better description yeah 
Did you have any thoughts about the other characters that are in the dream? There's uh, there, there's two men, and there's a young man who goes first, and then there's a mother with she who has a teenage two. daughter, but apparently she has two children as well. Yes, I was interested. Uh, I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> well, we'll both have a go. <laughs> both have a go, exactly. Yeah, what do you make of the number two? It's quite symbolic, isn't it? Yeah, well, well kind of in, in the... Uh, kind of symbology that I often work with, the number two represents the the unconscious or something emerging from the unconscious. Mm. I think that comes from a, a Jungian perspective, which knowing Jung probably comes from uh, another mystical tradition. I'm not quite sure where. But the way I think of it is that it, it's two aspects of something. There's the unconscious part, the unknown part, and there's the known part. And really, it's it's one thing, but it's as it starts to emerge, there's the piece we're familiar with and there's the piece that we don't yet know. Yeah, it fits in with the birth image mm. as well, doesn't it? Something new being born. Obviously, characters in dreams are always very interesting and I think if I was working with her, I'd ask her, particularly under the waking dream technique that we talk about, it would be interesting to take her back into the dream to see if she can see the faces on these characters, whether she actually recognises them when she goes back in. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for... Uh, a woman and for a man or either or, but the notion of the anima animus figure mm -hmm. that Jung talks about, the so the masculine qualities are held by the animus and the feminine qualities are held by the anima. And we have a couple of very strong anima animus images here, the young man, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. So that feels like it's very potent and powerful and has a very uh, powerful energy in some way. And does she say that she sees the young man and he's not ready to go through or she's ready to go through? I can't quite no, remember. No, the, the young man goes through first, oh, and, yes. but she's not ready to follow him yeah. yet, which really intrigued me yes. because, uh, again, it's not that every uh, male figure is... is representing the animus necessarily but what that animus is it's, it's this inner companion mm. and often it's the the role of the, the the psychopomp or the the role of the 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 friend who can guide you through the the difficult passage and take you into the depths of the unconscious it takes you into an encounter with the parts of yourself that you you don't already know and what's really interesting in this dream is that maybe, maybe this young man is in that role. So he shows the way, he goes through this passage. But what it shows is that it's not guaranteed that you're going to follow. Yeah. You still have a choice. And in this case, she feels like she's not ready yet. And so she's sitting on the edge of the pool. But, you know, with all this this feeling coming through that, that she's really upset and it feels like it's a kind of a dire situation for her. Yeah, you're hearing a beautiful interpretation, Dave. I was thinking, yes, this notion of choice, even in dreams, mm -hmm. our existential self can still choose whether it's going to do something or not. And in there lies her dilemma in yeah. some way. It feels a very, what I would call a very existential dream. Yeah, yeah. Which maybe we can put in contrast to this idea of, you know, it's a birth process and there's nothing to do but surrender to it and 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 go with it. It's actually, that is the only way to move forward, but you do actually have to choose to surrender. You actually do have to choose to go with the flow. And there's a point at which you do let go of control. But up until that point, yeah, you don't have to go forward. You can actually stay where you are. And until you're ready, and until you have everything that you need to finally take the plunge as it is for her. <laughs> as it, and the plunge pool is there. Yeah. And just briefly, I suppose we, we should mention the mother figure, the mother archetype. Here we have the mother archetype mm -hmm. who is... She has two children, again, the number two, to take care of, and her function is very clear. Mm -hmm. There is this sort of caring, uh, nurturing side, which I imagine as obviously is part of the dreamer's life. How does she tap into that nurturing side of herself mm -hmm. to enable her to make these type of choices? And almost separate from kind of the more universal symbolism that we might see present in this. I wonder then for this dreamer about the the 
experience she's had in life of a nurturing mother and is there something that that rings a bell for her of the mother being preoccupied with something or somebody else you know because she says that uh you know the, the mother says she won't leave her there but i know she will because she has two children to take care of and it's you know it makes me kind of feel for the dreamer it's like well who's who's taking care of you mm-hmm. Yeah, there feels like a lot of material there for somebody to work with in the way that the the mother figure, as you quite rightly say, has been discussed. Yeah. Anyway, it's a really lovely dream and it's a lovely to have the opportunity to spend time with a longer dream and, and see it in, in two parts and uh, see how it continues and expands and, and uh, yeah, just spend some more time with it. So thank you again to the, the dreamer who sent that in to us. Well, sweet dreams. Thank you very much and thank you to everyone for listening and keep dreaming and keep sharing your dreams. So thank you for joining us for this week's episode. Don't forget to like us and leave comments on your favourite podcast platform. As I'm sure you know, that's the way we build an audience for the Dreamboat podcast and also to spread news about dreaming. And as we said, there are many ways you can share your dreams at the DRI, the Dream Research Institute. Yes, we have courses, events and workshops, and we want to hear from you. So check out the show note for links or find us on Instagram as the Dreamboat Podcast, on our Facebook page as Dreamboat Podcast, on Twitter as at Dreamboat Pod, Or come and find us at dricpe.org.uk. That's dricpe.org.uk. And you can email us on drinfo at ccpe.org.uk. Once again, that's drinfo at ccpe.org.uk. And if you want to explore your dreams further or would like to support us, You can join the DRI as a member for just £10 a year. Yes, £10 a year. As a member, you will get discounts for our events and short courses. You'll get our newsletter with the latest Dream Research news. And we will also be adding other special member benefits during the year. Of course, members' dreams will always be given preference for reading on the podcast Dream of the Week slot. This low offer of £10 membership will last through to the end of June 2023. So go to the link on the show notes and become a DRI member today. Keep dreaming and keep sharing your dreams.